The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If it feels as if modern life has outsmarted our brains, tonight we'll have some insight to help restore the balance. First, author Mark Schatzker on the lies that food cravings tell us and why eating well is the best revenge. Then, neuroscientist and author Wendy Suzuki explains how to transform everyday anxiety into a superpower. Also ahead, Nan Kiwanuka talks to past Polaris Prize winner Havaya Mighty about her latest project. It's Monday, November 29th, and that's next on The Agenda. Despite a buffet of diet programs and endless nutritional advice, across North America, rates of obesity, heart disease, and diabetes continue to climb. In his new book, writer and journalist Mark Schatzker finds the explanation for that in our brains and our behavior in a world supersized by food technology. His book is called The End of Craving, Recovering the Lost Wisdom of Eating Well, and it brings Mark Schatzker back to our airwaves from Little Italy in Ontario's capital city. And Mark, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Not at all. Let's just go through some of them here because there's South Beach, there's Atkins, there's Keto, there's, uh, well, I don't have to go through the list. There's so many potential diets on offer. And I guess the, the first and obvious place to start in our discussion is, do any of them work? Well, the fact that you listed so many would suggest that perhaps not. But what's so interesting is our, our continued enthusiasm. You know, every two years, it seems there's a new diet, and we think this this must be right. And there's this walk down memory lane. You remember Scarsdale, The Zone. There's a reason, though, it's happening this way, and it's because diets both work and don't work. And here's how it works. All diets, roughly all diets, work for about the first six to eight months. You, you know, the pounds start to melt away. You, you fit into your old pants again. People start in the street, and they say, you look great. And then you hit this wall around six months usually, and you swear the scale must be lying, I'm not eating as much, what's going on, and it starts to come back. So people say, the diet worked, I failed, so they try the same diet again next year, or they try maybe a new diet. So that's why I've been kind of on this yo-yo treadmill of continually dieting. But, but the truth is, for most people, they don't work. You say they hit the wall. What technically is the wall? It's their brain. Uh, the brain, this is one of the most interesting things about body weight is that it's regulated by the brain. The same way your brain controls your heartbeat, the same way it controls your body temperature, it controls how much you weigh. And it, it doesn't like when we start to lose weight. That's why we get hungry. That's why we feel fatigued. But it also doesn't like if we weigh too much. When scientists do overfeeding studies, which is to say they put people in a lab and feed them a whole ton of food, they can't stand it. It's so unpleasant that they had to do these first studies in prisons. And even then people would drop out of the study. And, and, but then once they, you know, manage to get them fat, when the study ends, the pounds just seem to melt away again. So there's this idea that the brain has a set point. It, it has, you know, knows what, what it wants you to weigh, and it's, uh, it's going to make sure that's how much you weigh. This is a thesis that, of course, could put a lot of people out of business. Uh, so I, I'm kind of curious as to what kind of reception you're getting out there for this idea. Well, it's uh, it, what's so interesting to me is that We've had this endless culture about dieting. The scientists have known this for decades. The early overfeeding studies were done in 1950s, 1960s. Um, but we've almost as though we've chosen to ignore it, that, that we think we can control what we eat the same way you, you know, decide if I'm going to turn my car left, turn my car right, that, that we have executive control over our body weight. And it's just not like that. The reception I'm getting from, from readers is they're like, wow, thanks for making this clear. I had a funny feeling it worked this way. And and now, you know, it, it sheds a lot of light as to how things actually work. Now, you did something very nice in writing this book, and that is you got to go to Italy. You traveled to Italy, and you came back with some uh, most interesting observations about the nature of obesity in the United States compared to Italy. What did you find? Well, Italy is, it's like going down the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. Um, everything we think we know about eating and nutrition doesn't make sense when you travel to Italy. I spent some time in Bologna. That's where we get the word bologna. They call it mortadella, their version. I'd say it's better, but you can actually see these cubes of white fat. They're not afraid of fat in Italy. They're not afraid of carbs. Northern Italy is particularly interesting because they do not eat a Mediterranean diet. It's not olive oil and fish. It's butter. It's cheese. It's pasta. Um, they 
they revere the two nutrients we've been fighting a war against, which is to say fat and carbs, and they weave them together in these ethereal combinations that are so good, the entire world travels to Italy just so I can eat what that guy next to me is eating. They have rules. There's a repository in Bologna of official recipes. Um, they have a golden noodle at the Chamber of Commerce. It, it is the perfect platonic noodle. So you would think if deliciousness and good food is really the enemy, then you'd expect the North Italians to be the plumpest in all the world. And they are just unfathomab unfathomably thin. Uh, the rate of obesity in Canada is 26%, south of the border, 42%. Italy, 8%. It's, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling, and I think we need to follow up and get an explanation. If it's not the Mediterranean diet, what is it? Well, you know, I tried to say, what is so different about Italy? And what I found is, you know, there was a time when Northern Italy in particular was not so different. If you go back about a little over 100 years ago, both the American South and Northern Italy were suffering from an epidemic of pellagra, much like our obesity epidemic. Um, it was related to nutrition. N nobody knew that at the time. Uh, there was this, you know, rotating cast of experts that pounded their fists on the table and they said, it's mosquitoes, it's, it's sand flies, it's... It's fog. I mean, they had bizarre theories. We eventually learned it was a deficiency of an essential nutrient. This helped shape our understanding of vitamins. The particular vitamin is called niacin or B3. But what's so interesting is how the two cultures responded to it. Um, uh, the Americans passed laws encouraging, essentially making law um, enrichment or fortification, and we followed suit in Canada. We say if you're going to mill a flour, if you're going to make processed carbs, you've got to add B vitamins, niacin, riboflavin, thiamine, iron, which is a mineral. Um, the Italians took a, a bizarre approach, almost seemed steeped in peasant wisdom. They said, you know, poor people should eat rabbit. We should have uh, make bread in communal ovens. They even said people should drink wine, which sounds so strange, but it turns out back then the wines were not as well filtered as they are now, and a lot of the yeast in those wines had niacin. But what's really interesting is just how the two cultures looked at the problem. America said, something's wrong with food, and, and we humans are stupid, we don't know what's good for us, so we gotta step in there and fix what's wrong. The Italians saw pellagra as a disease of poverty, and they said the problem is these people don't have the right food. We saw food as the problem, they saw food as the cure. And over a century later, we still see this difference in this basic attitude. We live in fear of food, they embrace it. You make a, a really interesting analogy in the book to gambling, and I'm gonna read an excerpt from your book right now and bring that out. Sheldon, if you would, let's have that graphic. Gambling, especially problem gambling, is a lot like obesity in that way. Both are self-destructive, often ruinous forms of pleasure-seeking. Problem gamblers wish they could stop gambling the same way problem eaters wish they could stop eating. The comparisons do not end there. Gambling may be the best window we have into understanding why people eat beyond their needs. Okay, a bunch of things to unpack here. Where did the notion that gambling as a potential analogy to overeating, where did that come from? Well, it's because we see um, similarities when we look at the brain science. Um, the brain science confirms much of what we see in Italy. The, the knock against people with obesity is that they indulge in pleasure too much. Um, and so if you, if you look at the brain from the point of view of pleasure, scientists call it hedonics, there's two circuits. Um, there's what we call, there's the dopamine circuit, which, which fires wanting at its, you know, visceral, it's, it's, it's a desire at its most intense, it's craving. And then there's this pleasure impact moment. And that's a different part of your brain. It's related, but different. Uh, it's mediated by the opioid neurotransmitters. And that's liking. That's when you put the food in your mouth and it tastes great. And people have always thought the problem with people with obesity, it's that liking part. They put the food in their mouth. They, they don't know when to stop. They, they don't have the good sense to say enough is enough. It's not what the brain science shows us. Like with problem gambling, we see the problem is too much of this dopamine, too much wanting. They see a, a picture of a piece of pizza, a milkshake. They smell that cheeseburger and they are seized by a desire to eat it. When it comes to actual pleasure, if anything, it's blunted. So, so as with problem gamblers, they're not getting a whole lot of enjoyment out of it, but they are seized by a desire to eat that they, that they wish they didn't have. If we intellectually know that, and if we intellectually know that one or two minutes after overindulging on food, we're probably going to forget about how much we enjoyed the taste of it that second, why do we do it? Because it is so strong, because, um, you know, we can't just spontaneously switch off our desires. They have a profound control over us. They're with us, you know, endlessly. They just don't go away. So I think the question we have to ask is, what is it in this world that has changed such that people are experiencing these desires that are really out of sync with their physiological need?
And what's the answer to that? Well, I talk about nutri um, nutritive mismatch um, because what I'm really looking for is how food changed. And it's not fat. It's not carbs. These nutrients haven't changed in millennia. Um, we consume more of them. But what we have to ask is why would the brain change? And it's because for so long, this goes right back to enrichment, we thought the brain was stupid. We thought the appetite comes from the Stone Age. It's a moron. It doesn't know what's good for us. So we have to step in and fix it. And there's so many technologies we have created to change the way food tastes. Some of these are intentional, things like artificial sweeteners or fat replacers. But some of them, things like emulsifiers, stabilizers, modified starches, they they have all sorts of uses in food processing that can improve shelf life or make something look better. It won't turn into a puddle when you microwave it. But these change the information your brain is getting about food. The brain is very smart. When you eat, as you taste food, your brain is getting a reading about there, these are the nutrients coming in. But then it does kind of a post-game analysis. And when now, for the first time ever, these don't always match up. Sweetness, you know, from evolution, sweetness was always an indicator of calories. More sweet, more calories. The same with the sensation of fat. But now we've created all these taste sensations that deceive the brain. And how does the brain respond? Well, it's like if you filled your car with gas and it turned out maybe that pump wasn't working, I got, I didn't get any, you know, you'd want to attach another gas tank to your car to make sure I, I don't want to run out. So these new technologies, these artificial sweeteners, these artificial fats, you're telling us they have in fact been designed in order to deceive the brain so we'll consume more. Is that right? Well, they were designed to deceive the brain thinking that the brain was stupid. But if it turns out the brain is smart and it's constantly analyzing what you ate, this isn't such a good idea. So th th these, these were all predicated on this idea that the appetite was just sort of this relic from a past that makes no sense and, and we can step in and control things. But the brain is far smarter. It's, it's like a forensic accountant constantly analyzing what we eat. And it responds in ways that seem counterintuitive. But if you understand the brain is kind of a prediction engine that thinks about the future, future based on what it experienced in the past, this response that we see, this elevation and desire to eat, it makes perfect sense. How about fake fats, Mark? What are they? Well, I, I call them fake fats. The industry calls them fat replacers. And what's so interesting about them, th th these are the technology that came around in the 1980s when you start to see things like, um, you know, margarine with fewer calories, light salad dressings, light mayonnaise. This gives your brain the sensation of fattiness, which is to say that rich mouth filling creaminess with fewer calories. If the brain is stupid, what a great idea. Fool that dumb brain. If the brain is smart, maybe this isn't such a good idea. But what's so interesting about, about fat replacers, fake fats, artificial fats, is that we know so little about them. We know a lot about artificial sweeteners. We know the brand names. They tend to be branded. The fat replacer industry has been very smart. They, they don't want people to know. Uh, if you look at the industry literature, you'll say that it has a clean label. So there's one called Cream Fiber 7000. This is a fat replacer meant to be used in muffins. If you see it on the ingredients, panel, it shows up as citrus fiber, which, you know, I mean, that sounds healthy, that's roughage, that must be good for you. So what's so interesting about fat replacers is this, in, you know, they're in all sorts of food because manufacturers really want to bring that calorie number down on that on that nutritional info panel. So we're eating more and more of them. They show up in, in even regular cream or regular yogurts. Um, and there's been not enough work done on them. And, and so many people are eating them and, and just don't realize it. How about this? Uh, it, it, you've, you've got to believe that people take vitamins because they think it's contributing to their health. But there is this notion you suggest in your book that they're actually contributing to obesity. Have I got that right? Yes, I know. And I'll be the first to say, like, this sounds totally nuts. This guy's saying vitamins are contributing to obesity. I and mean, what's next? Like spring water, rain. Um, but, but it's very interesting. If you look at the science, the diet that Southerners and Northern Italians were eating was, was well, in the South, it was pork fat, grits, and molasses. So carbs, fat, and sugar. A very calorically dense diet, yet these people were starving. How could that be? It's because niacin, the B vitamins, they are involved in energy metabolism. Now let's fast forward the clock to about the 1950s and let's look at how we raised pigs. Because back then, farmers wanted to feed their pigs the same stuff. Let's give them lots of corn and let's give them lots of soybeans. They knew that that can really make pigs gain weight quickly. But if you gave them too much of that, they would get sick. They would get a pellagra of their own. Their hair would fall out. They'd, you know, they'd get diarrhea and then they would die. And that's because they knew this was not a nutritionally complete diet. So they sent the pigs out to pasture where they would eat alfalfa. Um, all our 
you know, pork used to be pastured pork. The invention of or the discovery of vitamins changed livestock farming forever. We talk about CAFOs, confined feeding. None of this would have been possible without the discovery of vitamins, B vitamins in particular, because that means you can feed your pigs this rocket fuel feed of corn and soy, and you don't have to bother with the alfalfa. You don't have to send them out into the fields. They can just keep consuming this rocket fuel feed. Well, that's how we got pigs to be big and fat really quickly. Turns out we did the same thing to our own processed carbs. And it's not just the enrichment that the government says, you know, is the law. Um, they're in energy drinks. They're in cereals. They, um, companies love to put in vitamins. And there's all these, you know, nutritional, uh, you know, experts all over the web selling you their supplements because everyone thinks, you know, vitamins, they got the word vital. They must be healthy. Well, there's a class of vitamins that are involved in energy metabolism. And our problem is we're eating too many calories. And to eat too many calories, you also need to have a commensurate level of too many of these B vitamins. Mark, you asked two really simple but profound questions as it relates to the difference between how Italians eat and how Americans eat. And I'll, uh, again, Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind putting this graphic up here. This is the quintessential American question about food. How will this affect my body? This is the quintessential Italian question about food. Is this the best recipe? That's really brilliant. And I wonder how, after having done all the work that you've done, are you any closer to figuring out how we actually can strike the right balance between nutrition and pleasure? Well, I think more of the latter and less of the former, as strange as that sounds. Um, we've been, you know, these expert nutritionists for decades. We talk about carbs, we talk about fat, keto, paleo, insulin, ketosis. We don't really have any clue what we're talking about. The scientists who study this, PhD physiologists, don't understand exactly how this works. And we carry on as though we have this, this brilliance. The Italians uh, never lost faith in the in the purity and goodness of food. And the idea that the pleasure it brings tells you something, tells you something real and important. We, we did not evolve to be nutritionists. We evolved to eat real food. And the sensations and the joy that it brings us, I think, are very important. It sounds crazy. You'd think the Italians, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. They're just loving food, but it's clearly working better. OK, you ready for my high, tight fastball here? Sure. I know there are going to be people watching this right now looking at you and saying, how much of this, does this guy weigh? OK, Mark, how much do you weigh? I weigh 171 pounds, and I'm six feet tall and one half inch. OK, so you have no comprehension, obviously, about uh, what it's like to have to lose weight, to be 50 pounds overweight. And for those people who are watching this right now and thinking that about you, what do you want to come back at them with? Well, I want to come back at them with um, I, I lead a food-obsessed life, but I think it's a very healthy relationship with food. My first book was about steak, and I literally traveled the world eating steak. But what I see continually, it's not just in Italy. Um, if you look at Japan, uh, J the Japanese are as food-obsessed as you can get. South Koreans as well. These are countries that revere their own food traditions. They do not live in fear of food. And the food they eat is so incredibly good. Uh, I see so many people here in such a, a negative relationship with food. They, they see it as a poison. They live in fear of of it. And, and it, it, it really is, I think, a good news to think that it does not have to be this way, that you can have a fulfilling, wonderful relationship with food and, and literally not pay a heavy price. The cover of your book has a beautiful piece of delicious chocolate on the cover of it. How often do you indulge in that? Oh, probably once a night. I have a piece of dark chocolate after dinner. Um, I love chocolate. It's a uh, it's, it's like a gift from God, if, if you believe in God. I'm not a believer, but I'd say chocolate's as good of an argument as any. That there, that there might be a God up there. Uh, can you eat uh, as much chocolate as you want whenever you want? I guess I could, but I don't actually eat that much. Um, what I tend to do, you know what, actually what I've been binging on lately are these clementines, the ones that just come in from Morocco at the beginning of the season. They have this, this tartness that balances with the sweetness. It's one of my favorite times of year is just to eat clementines. Uh, okay. How, I mean, clementines uh, obviously seem, you know, it's fruit. It's got to be good for you, right? Can you, can you basically eat anything you want in moderation? Maybe that's the better follow-up. Yeah, I think you can. I think it's important to look at food. Don't count the calories. Count the pleasure. And is the pleasure worth it? You know, you mentioned chocolate. And I, and I visited with um, a researcher in Germany. She treats some of Germany's most difficult cases of disordered eating. She has many people, uh, her, her patients suffer from binge eating disorder. They experience these absolute explosive cravings to, to literally eat themselves to the point where it physically hurts. And one of the therapies she has developed is when they get these cravings, she will give them, uh, she says, just eat a fine chocolate. 
And I went through this therapeutic technique with her and it's amazing how much pleasure just a small square of chocolate can deliver and it can actually extinguish this, this explosion of craving. So you don't have to have three Snickers bars in order to feel sated. I would say go for the go for the better chocolate. Yes, <laughs> gotcha. Now, of course, we're on the cusp of um, a time of year when people are typically encouraged, invited, and so on to to overindulge, do whatever they want when it comes to eating. How do we, in which case, let's take your advice? How do we train our brains to avoid unhealthy food and not to overindulge and to deal with our cravings in a more intelligent way? What's the secret? Well. You know, it, the holidays are interesting. You know, this idea of feasting and, and and enjoying food together, we see that in healthy food culture. So I, I think there's a lot that's right about the holidays. We cook from scratch. We cook together. We eat together. It's what we do afterwards. And I think if people want to really change the way, you, you know, if you think that the appetite kind of has a mind of its own, how do you change its mind? I think staying away from so many of these, these tricks, um, things that are like low fat and light, the, the fake sweeteners, essentially processed food, because that's what we do when we process food is, is we change the way it sort of communicates with your brain. Eat wholesome food, but but make it an experience of pleasure. Be like the Italians, say, is this the best recipe? Enjoy the pleasure that food gets, gives you. It's, it's, it's doing more than just giving you pleasure. It's, it's telling you something important about it. Terrific. We'll keep that admonition in the back of our heads as uh, the holiday season approaches. In the meantime, uh, we are happy to remind people that Mark Schatzker's latest is called The End of Craving, Recovering the Lost Wisdom of Eating Well with a beautiful piece of chocolate that I just want to grab right now on the cover of the book. Mark, thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Be well. Thank you so much. Before COVID-19 arrived, and definitely since, anxiety has been a constant companion for many people. That doesn't sound good, but for some, there may be a silver lining. Wendy Suzuki, a neuroscientist at New York University, explains why in her new book, Good Anxiety, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion. And she joins us now from Manhattan Island in New York City for more. Dr. Suzuki, it's great to have you on TVO tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all. I thought we'd start by reading an excerpt from the book and then we'll come back and chat. So Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up and we'll all read along together. From global pandemics to crashing economies to intense daily family challenges, we all have plenty of justifiable reasons to feel anxious. The relentless 24-hour news cycle and the constant stream of social media just add to this unease. We are surrounded by too much information to filter and too much stimulation to relax. The stress of daily living seems inescapable. Is feeling anxious inevitable? I'm going to get you to answer that question in a second, but before you do, is there an official definition of anxiety you can give us so we're all on the same page here? Absolutely. The definition of anxiety that I use is that feeling of fear or worry typically associated with an uncertain situation, which helps explain why in this age of COVID-19 that anxiety levels, both clinical levels and everyday levels of anxiety, have risen globally. Absolutely. Now, you presumably could have studied any number of thousands of different things, but you chose anxiety. How come? Because, and this was even before the start of the pandemic, I started to notice a, a really noticeable increase in anxiety in my students at New York University. Uh, not only in the students, in my friends, in my colleagues, in myself, there was definitely something happening there. And um, that is what made me inspired to start to look at this from a neuroscientist perspective. And now to the very timely question that you just asked in the book there, and particularly given what we've all been through over the last 19 months, is feeling anxious inevitable? Yes. Anxiety is one of our natural emotions, and it is not surprising that in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, and um, uh, as we've all experienced, that we will all have these feelings of anxiety. Just because the feelings of anxiety are inevitable does not mean that there are not approaches to turn that volume down. In fact, I spend so much of my book talking about the science-based approaches to turn the volume down 
on your anxiety, which is the first way to start to get to good anxiety, which <laughs> I talk about. Indeed, but presumably we, I mean, it's evolutionary. We need some of it to, to make sure we don't get in trouble, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Anxiety at its core from an evolutionary perspective, not only the emotion of anxiety, but that physiological stress response that comes with it is protective for us. It's in fact critical for our survival. So um, it is protective and critical, even though I know all of you out there are thinking, I'm not feeling protected by my anxiety one little bit. And the reason is because Collectively, as a society, our anxiety levels have been turned up so high with not just COVID, but global warming and news cycles and social media, and even the weather report can be scary these days. Hmm. So um, step number one is turning down the volume on your anxiety. It may also be the case, I guess, that, that well, there's kind of two different kinds of anxiety. There's the everyday anxiety that you write about in this book, and then there's the sort of clinical anxiety, which is a much more, it's a different thing. You're focusing yes. on the first. How, yes. how would you distinguish it from the second? So the second is, um, you know, it is that debilitating form of anxiety, uh, clinical levels of anxiety uh, that have gone up uh, um, to 30% of the population since the pandemic. Before the pandemic, it was about 20%. Now it's 30% of the population have clinical levels of anxiety. It's debilitating. It stops you from being able to live your everyday life. And um, that is when you need a medical professional. So if it is stopping you from... Um, doing your job, from having normal relationships, that is when you should start to consider uh, going to see a, a professional. And the physical consequences of all of that can be what? The physical consequences are daunting and devastating. This is essentially the physical consequences of long-term stress, that physiological stress response that comes with anxiety. Every time we're anxious, what happens is our heart rate goes up, our respiration goes up, and blood gets shunted to our muscles so that we can either run or fight, that fight or flight response, which is great in the moment. That is why it is protective and essential for our survival. But imagine having that response all the time uh, at every drop of a potential uh, uh, scary thing happening that is happening all, all around us. What happens is long-term, physiologically, it leads to heart problems, heart disease, um, ulcers, reproductive problems, and in the brain, high levels of the stress hormone cortisol can start to first damage and then kill brain cells in your hippocampus and your prefrontal cortex, two brain areas critical for long-term memory and decision-making, um, uh, respectively. Okay, I am going to introduce a new word here. Well, actually, introduce is the wrong word to use because we've talked about it on this program many times in the past, uh, particularly with uh, guests like Dr. Norman Doidge, who's from around here. We talk about neuroplasticity. And that's yes. what you're into. You want to tell us what yes. that is? So brain plasticity or neuroplasticity is the brain's amazing capacity to be able to change and grow um, in response to the environment. Unfortunately, so that's good positive brain plasticity. There's also negative brain plasticity, which shows that in other negative environments that include a lot of stress, your brain can actually shrink and become damaged. So we can go in both directions. And my whole research program has been in trying to understand those um, interventions that bring us to positive brain plasticity that helps our brains grow and strengthen. So it is possible to live with anxiety in a healthy way, yes? Yes, absolutely. For example? Think about a situation where there's no anxiety at all, no stress at all. What comes with anxiety and that energy that comes with stress is action. It uh, comes ambition. And so without that stress and, and uh, anxiety, uh, we would be just laying on the couch all over the place. A lot of our motivation comes from that um, uh, emotion of anxiety. And so what I try and do in my book, Good Anxiety, is show you how to channel the energy uh, of anxiety from that too high an energy that, that makes everything spiral down and makes you lose your words and, and not perform well to that 
slot where you are performing best. I always say the best talks that I've ever given in my whole life I was scared, I was anxious before I went on stage, and that is a great example of channeling your anxiety to perform well. So should I infer that because I don't think you're demonstrating any anxiety right now at all in your conversation with me, that you're completely calm and not all that fussed about doing this interview? I am an excellent actress. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, well done. So, you know, when it's a TV interview and potentially millions of people can see, I am I am a little anxious before, and I just try and tell myself, enjoy yourself, have a good time, just try and uh, share your knowledge. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, I have skills that have come with being a professor <laughs> and being a public speaker. But, yeah, I, uh, there's something a little bit wrong if I'm not a little bit worried, a little bit tense about is all this equipment going to work? Is my Internet going to go out? Are they going to ask me? The one thing that really gets me scared is are they going to ask me something I don't know the answer to? <laughs> so as long as you don't do that. I'm going to stay nice and calm. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I feel the same way before each interview, too. So we've got that going in common. There you go. Talk to us about your six superpowers, because you do mention them in the book about how to channel good anxiety. The six yeah. are what? Yeah. So, you know, um, the ultimate uh, uh, end point of learning how to use your good anxiety. You turn the anxiety down and you kind of learn from those difficult emotions. But it took me to six gifts or superpowers that I talk about in the book. And those six gifts are resilience, flow, mindset, productivity, empathy or compassion, and creativity. And um, I don't think we have time to talk about all of them, but these are things that are truly enhanced by your particular form of anxiety. And um, it was something that I realized, you know, with great pain comes great wisdom. And anxiety is, is, can be a painful emotion. It is um, uncomfortable. It is pointing out something that we need to pay attention to. And I asked myself, what are the learnings that come from that everyday anxiety? And these are the gifts that came out of that um, examination. Well, here's where our conversation takes a bit of a hard turn because I want to talk about chapter four of your book now. You know what yes. that means. And, and I do. we're going to share with our viewers what that means now. I note with interest that you put resilience as number one on your list of six superpowers and you in a very profound and difficult way, found out firsthand about yeah. how resilience could work or needed to work in your life. Yes. When, when your poor brother died at the age of 51. Would you take us through yes. that, please? Yeah. So, you know, I was in the middle of um, getting ready to really start writing this book. We had the outline ready, and it was the week that I was about to jump in and start writing all about resilience. You know, the book hadn't really before been formed. I wanted to look at the resilience from, uh, sorry, um, anxiety from a positive point of view. But then I experienced um, a real tragedy in my life. Um, it wasn't just my younger brother who suddenly passed away of a heart attack, but it was just three months after our father had passed away unexpectedly of a heart attack. And um, that was an anxiety that was grief. It was deep grief, um, probably the most difficult emotions that I've ever experienced in my life. I felt, you know, after um, getting myself psyched up to dive into the difficult emotions of anxiety, I felt like I, I was I plunged into a master class of difficult anxiety, uh, of difficult emotions when, when this happened. And yes, it took a while to uh, come out of it. It was so painful, but you know, there was a, a moment where I was um, doing a workout with a trainer. It was a video workout and Phoenix, my trainer said, you know, with great pain in the context of working out comes great wisdom about your body. And I thought, that is so profound. That is exactly what I need to hear today. 
because I have just gone through the biggest pain in my life. And what I realized is that what came out of it is a new appreciation of love and family and friendship and connection that remained. Um, I talk about it as kind of Dorothy coming out of that black and white part of the movie into the technicolor of Oz. And um, I wish I didn't have to realize that because of the loss of my father and my brother, but it was a profound change that has changed my relationship ever since that happened. And I took that learning and that resilience and that, that wisdom um, and I applied it to the book and came out with those six superpowers that we just went through. Um, and the book is dedicated to my father and my brother. And it would not have been the same had, um, had that not happened in the middle of writing this book. Hmm. How long did it take you to get that wisdom? Six months, eight months, something like that. And you know, I was active about it. I, I always had a regular exercise program. I also always had a regular meditation program, um, which I talk about a lot in the book as great tools to combat anxiety. Well, they're also great tools to combat grief. Um, so it was uh, um, daily workouts, daily meditations, reaching out to friends, and and um, um, and really kind of coming together in our little pod of the family. My my mom and my sister in law and my niece um, we're closer now, and I, I appreciate that every day. Hmm. Uh, this may be a bit of a bizarre coincidence to introduce here, but I'm going to try anyway. My father's father died at 51 of a heart attack, so you have that element in common there. And I remember asking him many years ago, you know, how do you get over that? You know, no, no, nobody's supposed to die at 51. Yeah. And um, his answer was, we just sort of had to. People were tougher back then. Right. And uh, could I get you to compare tragedies of many years before with tragedies today where we may be more in touch with our emotions today or we may be more understanding of of being allowed to grieve publicly today in ways that were not possible back then and how significant those differences might be? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I mean, my mind um, immediately went to the fact that families were larger and uh, healthcare wasn't nearly as good. So death and death in your close family members was probably more common than it is today. Um, of course, it still happens, as it, as it happened to me, kind of this double whammy, um, uh, especially my, my younger brother, which was the, the one that was just so unfathomable. And I, I think that, you know, death has been a constant <clears throat> throughout our evolution, and um, it's always going to be hard um, because we are social species, and we, we thrive on that social connection no more strongly than with our own family members. And so um, I think it, it, yes, I think uh, your father was right. They, they had to do it. We all just have to get over it. There's nothing, there's nothing that we can do. Um, what, uh, what, is, what is valuable and what I learned from this experience is that um, those uncomfortable feelings, those difficult feelings, are there for a reason. They're telling us how much those people meant to us. And the deeper the feelings and the more difficult the feelings, the more that they meant. So, so it's like an emotional tribute to the person that went away. And I, I took that kernel of knowledge and I tried to apply it to this emotion that has been kind of running rampant, but at its core is also protective. It is helping us. It is showing us what is going well in our lives and what is what is important to us. We worry about the things that are important to us that in the same way that we grieve for the people that we love the most. What is that signal? And that is the signal that I tried to harness in the six superpowers of anxiety that I talk about in this book. We talked about resilience a lot there. Is there one other one that you that you think we need to, well, I know they're all important, but which, which <laughs> second one would you like to tell us a little more about? Well, uh, the second one and one of my favorites is um, 
empathy, the superpower of empathy. And this comes from my oldest form of anxiety that I've brought with me since childhood. Um, despite my ability to speak to you uh, and speak to my classroom, uh, as a child and a young young student and even a college student, I was very shy, I was um, a wallflower, I was very awkward, and I always had years of really wanting to ask questions in class but being afraid that I was gonna be wrong. Of course, that's the fear that all students have. And I realized that that form of my own personal anxiety has created an empathy super superpower in me because I'm at the front of the classroom now. And what I find myself doing uh, unconsciously is not just answering the students that raise their hand, love those students, but I always stay late, I arrive early and make sure that all the other students that don't wanna speak in front of class but have plenty of questions for me, do that. It is my teaching superpower. And that's just me. What is your most common anxiety? And you know it well, you know what it feels like, you know what it looks like. Can you turn that to the outside and help somebody else? That becomes your superpower of empathy that originates with your own form of anxiety. In which case, let's finish up on this because we want to leave people with some good advice, as in exercise, deep breaths. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk about the importance of that, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So my number one go-to, because everybody asks, you know, I'm, I'm starting to have anxiety. What should I do right now? My number one go-to is deep breathing, because I'm here to tell you that deep breathing is activating your natural de-stressing part of your nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. This is part of the nervous system that, um, that helps you respond to that fight or flight response by decreasing your heart rate, decreasing your respiration, and shunting blood from your muscles to your digestion and reproductive organs. So the best, easiest, most direct way to activate that is to breathe slowly and deeply. I recommend a boxed breathing technique where you inhale on a four count, hold for four counts, exhale on a four count, and hold for four counts. You can do this um, in the middle of an anxiety provoking conversation when the other person is talking at you and making you anxious. Um, you can teach your kids to do it uh, so they can do it in school when they're starting to get anxious. It is, uh, um, it is a panacea for, for anxiety. Moving your body, taking a walk outside is my number two. Uh, it also, what, what it's doing is stimulating the release of dopamine, serotonin, neuroadrenaline. It's like you're giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath of all of these wonderful neurochemicals and um, that, that act to decrease anxiety and depression levels. So those are my number one and number two go-tos if you need to decrease your anxiety level today. Well, I can tell you, this has been anything but an anxiety-provoking conversation. This has been really helpful. It's been a delight to meet you. Good Anxiety is the name of the book, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion, and it's brought Dr. Wendy Suzuki to our virtual studio from New York City today. Thank you so much, Dr. S. It's been great having you on. Thank you so much for having me. Tomorrow on the Agenda. Canadians get it. They get the interconnectedness of my experience as a mother having to keep my kid home from school. That came from outside of our borders. That's affecting and impacting people around the world. And there's a mother over in Tanzania who's also keeping her kids at home. So they got, Canadians understood inherently this idea that we, that, that the pandemic has really shown how interconnected we are. That's tomorrow on the agenda. Some of the biggest names in rap come from right here in the GTA. And Havaya Mighty is an artist that you should look for. Her debut studio album won the Polaris Prize in 2019. And now the songwriter, vocalist, producer, and performer has a new project out. It's a mixtape called Stock Exchange, and it brings Havaya Mighty to our airwaves tonight from Brampton. Hi, Havaya. Nice to meet you. Hi. How are you? Nice to meet you. Uh, so you have a problem that a lot of artists would love to have. You have two cities claiming you, Toronto and Brampton. Uh, which one is it? Born in Toronto uh, and, and living in Brampton. So it's both. It's both. Okay, great. Um, we're, <laughs> I, I have a little bit of a clip to show from your song, Protest. Uh, and then we're going to we're gonna talk about the mixtape. Uh, Sheldon, could you please roll? Let's do it. I got the over-the-shoulder look. Pop down, pop down. I'm eating the
boy I want track down. Whole squad pulled up, so they ran down. That door, so the door get run down. When we see them, my heart just sank down. It seems like the boy want to crack down. Bro, man down. Y'all need to broaden your scope. Picture you got darker skin and broaden your nose. I be sick when I be thinking about the trauma we know. This shit is scripted. Watch the drama unfold. I mean, that is such, uh, the visuals of that video and the song itself, We I wanna talk about it in a little bit, but I wanted to talk to you about the mixtape Stock Exchange. What is the story behind that? Yeah, so the project Stock Exchange was initially not a project at all. I was just putting out singles in what I think was kind of the most chaotic time that many of us have experienced, which was the be beginning of the, the pandemic. And in 2020, was it 2020? Yeah, I had a very momentous year, I had a lot of, shows planned and then everything kind of was canceled. So my year in particular just really kind of revamped because of the plans were really contingent on traveling and, and being able to do that. So these restrictions uh, made that not possible and I wanted to keep creating. And my idea behind that was like, let me just make songs. Like, I don't know what stories to tell right now. I'm, I'm staying at home via these orders. I'm not getting inspiration, but I know I can still make songs. And that was the intention. And uh, I started putting these songs out November of 2020, month to month. So November, December, January. By February, I think that what I realized was a commonality between these releases was not really so much the thematic content of the songs, but the, the, the way it was received and the perception of it on the back end after it was released and how that was impacting me and how I valued myself. Like that really actually became the common theme. Um, and I started to realize that it was almost like you're you're as good as your last release and people value you based on kind of the content that you've put out most recently and that was something i had to toggle with and understand okay numbers stats data analytics these things that we you know that are related to the stock market that kind of tell us what the perceived value of, of a thing is those sorts of things are important to the business but they uh they do not indicate self-value and i had to kind of create that distinction and so a lot of the stock exchange project is me kind of toggling with that idea and kind of separating my self validation from what people might think I should like what numbers I should be getting what streams I should be getting and realizing that it that it is separate and that you know validating self really really does come first and that in itself will allow me to kind of create music that hopefully will achieve those data stats analytics comments whatever that a musician would hope to kind of attain but it was that struggle of not knowing how to validate myself at the beginning of that process um it's interesting the word that you use struggle um what did you learn about yourself during the process of making a mixtape knowing what you just said the biggest things that i learned was i think a little bit of a balance um i think just kind of trying to not do music or work all the time and like with the pandemic of course we were forced to be home mm -hmm. and so that kind of forced me to sit with myself internalize thoughts process thoughts and not be as uh, avoiding of kind of certain concepts or themes i was not thinking about certain things that had to do with self whether it was like my health or habits that i want to have outside of music because i was just so busy with the music i was just on road all the time mm -hmm. um and so that pivot helped me to like understand that life is about more than just kind of like that creative output i can still very much value that and put that at the forefront but like having that balance will also allow me to tell better stories and allow me to be more intuitive with self so i think that's really what i learned over the last two years and why call it a mixtape instead of an album it's it, that's an interesting question i think a lot of people there are distinctions that don't really exist anymore. It could be an album, it could be a mixtape. For me, I called it a mixtape because it was never intended to be an album. And so really for me, the intention behind it is is that distinction for me. It was meant to just be singles. It was not meant to be a project at all. Um, but because it became that, to me, it's a compilation of songs that kind of fit an overall theme, but they were not designed to be an album like let's say my previous works of 13th Floor was. And so for me, that is what made that distinction of mixtape. I want to go back to the song that we played at the beginning, which is protest. Uh, you once said that, quote, my fear always as a black woman is to write a song about my experience, but with too much of my opinion. Why did you feel like that? Um, I think, I think I know what you're referring to. I think it's the fear of people 
expecting a certain message from me and therefore the message not being as impactful. I think that's what I was trying to convey with that. The fear is as a black woman, when I talk about racial issues that have impacted me for some audiences, it's kind of like, oh, of course you feel that way sort of sort of thing. And then it takes away from the impact of the song or the important messaging in the song because the the messenger is expected, let's say. And so I think I was referring to I'm not sure where you pulled the quote from, but I think I was referring to 13 because it was a song that I wrote off of the last project talking the 13th about the Amendment. 13th Amendment. Yeah. yeah. But what was really powerful about that song was that I didn't feel like it was really my opinion. Like I had done some research, I'd come upon some understanding that can be found online. Like it has nothing to do with opinion. And it's one of, I think, one of my most powerful songs because the impact can't be removed by the messenger. You can't, you can't listen to that song and think these are opinions. It's very clearly like a, 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 like something that that was researched and 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 thought out and put together. And so, yeah, like I just worry that like sometimes it, the message might fall on deaf ears mm. because of the expectation of well, maybe it's not it's not surprising, I guess, maybe that messaging coming from me, especially at this point, um, me being as vocal as I am. It's interesting. It's interesting. Sorry to, uh, to interrupt. I think it's interesting because you would think that because it's coming from you, it actually makes it more valid. And maybe to some people it does. Um, but I think I've seen enough comments on social media and stuff to know that for some people it's like, she only got this because of X, Y, Z. Like, so there is a little bit of a kind of like a putting in a box. And I think maybe not being able to receive certain messaging from certain people because it's just like, well, I... I feel like it's coming with a bias, right? Like other people may feel it's coming with a bias because of my experiences. It's not coming with a bias, it's actually coming from uh, a bit of deeper understanding because of my experience, but I think that that can be interpreted differently. But it's not like enough of a fear that I don't talk about those things. It's just, I really try to improve my songwriting so that the impact can be felt regardless of who the messenger is. Um, you know, I grew up listening to rap music and a lot of people have these ideas and perceptions about what rap music is. For me, it helped me uh, find an identity when I didn't, uh, I, I didn't see myself anywhere reflected. Uh, you grew up in Ontario in a home full of music uh, and even you, took, you even took uh, singing lessons, I think from the age of four, uh, but you weren't allowed to listen to rap music. How come? I wasn't allowed to listen to rap music early on, I think because it was just a house of four young women and it was the 90s, so a lot of the rap music was not necessarily filtering content that I don't think my parents wanted us to see at that time. So I didn't start listening to rap until I kind of had, like, my own decision-making when I started listening to my cousin's um, Walkman and when I started listening to the radio and... Well, what drew you to it? Access. What drew, what drew you to what it? What drew me to it? I think yeah. the storytelling aspect, uh, definitely, and, like, the realness and rawness of what hip-hop represents. I think, like, for my parents, like, they don't... They're not, like, super hip-hop fans. Like, they're more... My dad's reggae, my mom's reggae and R&B. So, like, that was kind of... You know, and there was definitely overlap with what hip-hop is, but it wasn't actually, like hip-hop until I kind of found that I was gravitating towards what I think is really the storytelling aspect of hip-hop. It's just different than all styles of music in that you can really kind of get really particular with an experience, a story, uh, whatever, in that genre. And that was something that I, I really resonated with. Well, something that really bugs me to this day is that whenever you see the top five, they're always like, who are the top five MCs? And you never see any women. Uh, and I'm like, where's Lauren? Where's Yo-Yo? Um, right. uh, do you feel that, you know, you're one of the few uh, female rappers in this country. Do you feel like things are moving in a more equitable direction in the music? Mm, I, like I, based on my experiences and the fact that I've been able to kind of achieve, achieve more success, I've been making music for a long time. And while I wasn't necessarily like monetizing it or I didn't have a management team or I didn't like understand how to put myself out there, like I was making music for a while. And so to finally have that music be received, like I don't know if that's just indicative of my own journey or the overall kind of journey or changes that are happening within music. I do think that there are some changes that are happening. I do think there are more opportunities for people that generally weren't able to occupy certain spaces in music to now be doing that. Um, I definitely think it needs to change more. I think we're still, you know, we have a lot of like music that I think we're, we're kind of presented from bigger entities, but I think people want to have a bit more of a, more, more of a say with what is actually playing on the radio, what is actually like, you know, from the comments and stuff on, on social media and stuff, people want change. Like people really do want that. And so sometimes 
if a market can demand something, then the industry will kind of have to shift in that direction. And I think people want different things. I, I don't think that they want the same formula over and over again. And so with that, I think we're seeing a little bit of that, that change and in, in people like myself occupying space that, you know, five, 10 years ago, it just it wasn't really going to happen, especially in Canada. Well, in our final moments here, I know you're working on some things. Uh, what are some of the projects that you're working on? Yeah, uh, well, I have uh, a tour coming up with the Arkells. I'm really excited about that. That's going to be in, in February. And uh, so I, uh, I had a little health scare in October, so I kind of took some time off in terms of performing. But I'm excited to kind of get back on the stage, especially especially with those guys. We played a few shows together. Um, and uh, while I'm at home resting and making sure I'm good to go uh, in early 2022, uh, I'm starting an initiative. It's a Black entrepreneurship initiative where I'm looking to be giving back, you know, because I've, I've received a lot of accolades. I've received, you know, funding for my music output. And I want to kind of give back to other Black entrepreneurs that are creating and doing different things in different realms. And for me, I think one of the most validating things was receiving acknowledgement or funding for my output, for my art and realizing that other people see value in it as well as myself. And so I kind of want to extend that as someone who's in a position now where I can do that. You know, I'm, I'm excited to see more individuals doing things that they have only hoped and dreamed of. Havaya, thank you so much for being on the program. It's exciting uh, to see all the stuff that you're doing and the mixtape is terrific. Congratulations on everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that is the agenda for Monday, November 29th, 2021. Tomorrow is Giving Tuesday, and we'll find out how small charities are helping here and how international charities do their work abroad in a world dealing with COVID-19. And we hope you'll join us for that program on Giving Tuesday. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.